Good morning, everybody. Could we pray together before we get started? Father, we come to you today, and we each and every one are desperate for your intervention in our lives. We're desperate, some of us were desperate for greater understanding. And Father, some of us are, are just desperate for you, that they just don't have a relationship with you. And Father, some folks in here are, are desperate because there's a brokenness inside of them that only you can mend. And Father, there's a world around us that's desperate that we would get this right. Because if we get this truth of discipleship right, we literally could help change the world through you. And Father, so as we come to you in this time of desperation, speak to us. Speak to us not through my words, but speak to us through your word. And we trust that you're going to do just that. Amen. Amen. Well, this series is going to be a four-weeker, and in what we're going to see throughout this, this whole journey is we're going to look at what happens when somebody commits their life to Jesus? What happens before somebody commits their life to Jesus? And if somebody is truly a disciple, what is it that they should see in their life? So what we're going to see today, ultimately, that discipleship in the way that Jesus introduced discipleship, it began with a come and see moment. And next week, we're going to see that what it means that going beyond come and see, but also what it means to be saved and following. And then the, the next week after that, we're going to see how disciple, literally the word, mean, the, the word disciple, it means either learner or apprentice. So we're going to see about what it is that we need to learn, not just intellectually, but maybe even correcting some things that we have previously learned that are wrong. But then in the last week of this year, we're going to talk about how we're to be apprenticing after Jesus. And this isn't just a series and I want you to know that from, from my heart, this isn't just a series and like, well, it's just filling the calendar. This is literally paving the way for us into the future. This is what we should be about. This is a course correction of sorts. I'm going to talk about this later during our meal. But this is what it is that Dublin Bible Church is going to be about in the future. So the big idea, be what Jesus is saying with being a disciple and discipleship is characterized in est by establishing a fundamental life relationship to the person of Jesus. So a discipleship to Jesus is this relationship that's it's fundamental to, to true Christianity, this life relationship connected to the person of Jesus. What I have found, and we can, we can agree to disagree on some of these things, but I firmly believe, I believe that in the culture that, that we're doing ministry in right now, there are a lot of people who claim to be Christians, and maybe they, they, they are Christians in the way that I'm going to talk about in just a moment, but they're not disciples of Jesus. And yet, because this is a, be nice culture, a high, have a, a high level of morality culture for the most part, or a hospitable culture, or I'm going to make sure that I greet you if I see you in public culture. We just have this be nice nature to us that seems overtly Christian, but yet all of that is exterior, but yet if there hasn't been something has been shaped inside of us, because of the life relationship connected to the person of Jesus, you're not a follower of Jesus and you're not even a born again believer. So we have to get this right because the culture that we live in is in such a way, and, and I, I love this community, I'm not speaking ill of this community, but this is a problem here, is we have to get this right because many people are walking around thinking that they have this authentic walk with Jesus, but they don't. They just look like it on the outside, but on the inside, there's a void of this life connection to Jesus. Christian isn't even something that was used by Jesus at all. As a matter of fact, the first reference to this happened in Acts 11, verse 26. This mention was actually like something that was just talking about the people who were following Jesus and who, who were carrying on. Uh, the, the message of the kingdom of God, but it was, it was a word that they would use to speak ill of these people, not, not to speak well of them. And Christian, in our culture today, it, I have some things that I, I seem to think that it, 
what it means, and this is not just, again, my opinion, but this conversations that I've had, but also just observing the culture, because I believe that as a pastor in this community, I have to seek the, the, how the gospel is to be lived out in this context. I'm not trying to figure out the context in Iceland or Seattle or St. Louis or another city that begins with S. It's here. This is where I'm trying to figure it out, the context for here. So the, the word Christian here, to me, it, it's watered down. It's, it's diluted. It's in some diluted form of, of what true Christianity is supposed to be. It, it also means a lack of commitment. It means attending church. So I, it, it's this commitment. I, if I attend church regularly, as far as I, I'm considered, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, you should consider me a Christian. That's simply not the case. Or some other things that people who aren't followers of Jesus and that they would say about Christians is their life is no different than mine. Their life is no different than mine because they they lack true joy. So they're seeking the same thing, trying to fill these voids themselves. And ultimately, the word Christian today, I, I think it's synonymous with somebody who isn't truly changing. And if a disciple of Jesus is truly connected to the, to the life and person of Jesus, there will be change. There will be small, sometimes large, but there will be incremental change. And again, Jesus never used this term, so the... The question that's going to become the backdrop for this whole series and really probably this whole year is this. Am I going to be a Christian by today's standard or am I going to be a disciple by Jesus' standard? Am I going to be a Christian by today's standard or am I going to be a disciple by Jesus' standard? Because when Jesus talked about discipleship, it was very radical. It was radical in His day and it was, it's radical in our day. When, when Jesus would say things like, Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That way of discipleship is not like what we see in our culture. And yet, the Word of God is true, and Jesus' message was true then, and it's true today. It was true in, in that ancient context, and it's true in our context. And we have to figure out what it means in our context, in our day, what it means to truly follow Jesus. So the question again is this, am I going to be a Christian by today's standard or am I going to be a disciple by Jesus' standard? And this is what we will grapple with. This is, this is going to be the very thing that maybe is making you a little unsettled right now. Because e even in this, you're like, well, does my life measure up? And I want to say that is a great question. If you're asking that internally, that's a great question because that question, I believe people who ask great questions end up in good directions. People who ask good questions, they end up in good directions because they're asking the right question. More than likely, they're going to follow um, in, in the way that they ought to. I want us to reflect upon something very quickly, and it's a very familiar passage for all of us, most likely. So I want us to, to look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We're just going to look at this briefly. It's not the main passage. Actually, the main passage is in John 1. But I want us to look at this, and I want to tell you, again, why it is that we're talking about this idea of disciple or being a disciple of Jesus, or even discipleship, uh, even as a term. I love what Dallas Willard said. He said, in the heart of every disciple, there's a desire and a decision. So there's a desire and a decision. So with you, there are some things that I believe this is true, and the late and great Dallas Willard got this right. In the heart of every true disciple, there's a desire and there's a decision. There should be an inner desire for you to follow after Jesus and to submit to His Lordship in your life, and yet not only just the desire but also decisions that, base, that, that you are basing your life off of um, in with that desire. So, again, here's the Great Commission, verse 18. First, Then Jesus came to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I'm going to start with the last verse, or the last sentence of verse 20, and then just say a couple things before we move on to our main passage. And Jesus says, And surely I am with you always 
to the very end of the age. So there's a connection of discipleship to the life and person of Jesus. This is one of the promises of God. This is a promise that Jesus gives those who would submit their lives, not only to salvation of their sins, but also the lordship and direction of their lives. It's rooted here, and I'm sure, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The very presence of Jesus in a believer's life and in a true disciple's life is a promise of God. So, that thing first, and then also, right above that, and Dallas Willard calls this the great omission, but it's in teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and teaching them. And I I believe this is greater than just you sitting in here or sitting in some other gathering and listening to me teach something and be like, ooh, those are really good. This requires more than just simply observing me teaching or truths that I found. I believe that this is talking about practicing the presence of God, as some have said. If being in the presence of God, being connected to the life and person of Jesus, that's what we should expect as true disciples of Jesus. And in teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So what is it that we're supposed to do as a church? What is it that we're supposed to do as parents as we're discipling our kids? We're to be doing the same thing, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded them. And we are to then be, as parents, we are to be raising our children up in such a way that, that we would we can't see that they get saved, but we can sure invite them to be connected with the Scripture and godly people and, 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 and experiencing God outside of themselves, and hopefully that God would save even all of our children. Amen? Amen. All of our children. And yet we have to raise them up. If they're saved, we have to raise them up in a way that a disciple of Jesus should be rose up. And with that, it's with this awareness that that they too need to be connected to the life and person of Jesus. That's what a disciple ought to. See, I believe the part that we get the most is therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And we therefore go. And as a matter of fact, the emphasis for the last year was this idea of going and evangelism. I'm sure you heard it in my sermons. And so there's this idea of going. We always need to be thinking outside of ourselves. That the Christian walk isn't just our solo effort. It's always supposed to be our connection to God and, and that outflow to the community around us. And with that, I think we've, we have come to an understanding. We're not practicing it as well as we ought to, but we've come to this understanding. But it's the idea of making disciples, making students, making followers, making apprentices, making learners of Jesus, and then baptizing them as they give their life to Jesus, and then teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has said. You see, I fully expect in in the middle of this Sears, maybe in this talk, that some of us are going to be reaffirmed, okay, I do have an authentic walk with Jesus. There are going to be some other folks who who think that they have an authentic walk with Jesus, and they say, yes, I'm a Christian because of whatever reason. And I believe that as we go through this message, or maybe this series, what you're going to see is, my life just doesn't measure up to what the Bible says that a disciple of Jesus should. So it should... Uh, it will lead you to, hopefully, a desire uh, by the Holy Spirit's leading and also decisions to, to start following better. And, and I also know this. Some of you have already, you're already convinced in your mind that you're right. That you don't need to learn anything. I'm not naive. I've been doing this for a little while. And I know I, I, when I get in these settings, and I'm not trying to be unnecessarily harsh, but I know some people are just hard-hearted. My hope is the Holy Spirit would just tear those walls down so that you can truly be who it is that God wants you to be. Now let's go to our main passage, and we're actually going to look at what happened before the disciples were the disciples. We're going to see where it all started. In John 1, starting at verse 35, we're going to read through verse 51, or to verse 51, and we're going to see where it all started. And I believe that some of you are going to be surprised on where it all started. Because Jesus didn't start with a a real high commitment. He didn't start with, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That's not even where He started. He started in in a way that people were already curious about the faith. They were curious because it, 
started with ultimately a couple followers of John the Baptist. So people were curious into spiritual things. John the Baptist is somebody we talked about last year. We talk about occasionally. But he had a ministry of his own, and his ministry was literally just paving the way for Jesus. He was just waiting for Jesus to get there and for Jesus to, to start his earthly ministry. So here is where we're going to begin in verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed him. Turning around, Jesus saw them and followed and asked, What do you want? What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and he spent that day with them. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he, and he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Kephas. Which, when translated, is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, He is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered him, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This was connecting to the very Jewish nature of which that culture would know about. And what he's making reference to is Jacob's ladder from Genesis 28, verse 12. But he's also connecting to the fact that Jesus is ultimately the ladder between heaven and earth. So it wasn't that they were going to necessarily witness this fantastic thing, but it was the, the very fact that Jesus is the ladder between heaven and earth. So Jesus' first disciples... We're disciples of someone else. They've been following somebody else. But I want to start this at a very baseline level. Jesus meets people where they are. Jesus meets people right where they are. I absolutely don't want you to feel any condemnation coming from my, my mouth as I'm talking about disciple and talking about who is, who's possibly listening, who's in the room. I, I don't want you to, to think that there's any condescension coming from my heart or a condemnation coming from you. Because I, I want to be as much like Jesus as I can. And Jesus met people right where they were. He met people right where they were. But every single person who was curious about Jesus or Jesus had a direct interaction with, he met them right where they were, but He also called them to something better. And discipleship, is, it is in its nature that. It is Jesus is calling us to follow Him because He has something better. Discipleship isn't just, I need some more things to do. I, 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 need, I have some other things I need to add into my calendar. It isn't that now I have some other spiritual disciplines and I have spiritual formation and I need to attend this and I need to do that and now I need to go do these things. It isn't even a matter of that. When Jesus meets people where they are and yet He presents something better, there's always a grace element. Don't necessarily see it in this passage, but you see it in so many others. And the Apostle Paul just drew this out so many times. There's always a grace element. And the grace element was the very thing that I believe led to people's desire to follow. 
It wasn't, well, now I need to follow these rules to keep in following with Jesus. They had experienced the grace of God in such a way that they couldn't help but follow Jesus because he had just not only saved them from their sins, but also he had given them a better way to live. And I want the same for you. Romans 5.8 says this, but God demonstrates his own love in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But God demonstrates or he shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, meeting us right where we were, right in the, in the mud and the muck of our life, in the pain and the suffering of our life, in the, the circumstances of our own doing or the doing of someone else, Jesus meets us right there in that place. And the offer of the gospel is so good and it's so rich and it's so true that when God meets us right where we are, He demonstrates, He's already demonstrated His own love for us that while we were sinners, that it, it wasn't that we were a cleaned up version of ourselves. We were sinners. We were dead in our sins. And He took upon our sin by dying for us. For the Christian, 1 John 2.2 2 says this, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. And if that just doesn't spell grace, if that just doesn't proclaim to you how good God is, if that doesn't draw out something in you to make sure that, that you're following in the way that the Word of God says that you ought to follow, maybe something's broken inside, that He is the atoning sacrifice the covering that we need. Not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And yet, A.W. Tozer says something that I believe is sadly true. A notable heresy has come into evangelical Christianity, into the, in Christian circles. The widely accepted concept that we humans can choose to accept Christ only because we need Him as Savior and that we have the right to to postpone our obedience to Him as long as we want to. That is not biblically true. You cannot have a salvation from Jesus that you don't also accept Him as Lord of your life. If, if Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life, you are, and there's no salvation for your sin. <laughs> because all you wanted was, you wanted a band-aid for your sin. You're not, your desire for Him is just to clean up your mess so you can get on with your life. That's not the gospel message. It's better than that. And this was written 60, 70 years ago. Still true today. I think it's, this, this heresy is growing in, popu in popularity. And we have to get this right because if we get this wrong, we could be talking about the gospel in a way that's truly not the gospel and we could be condemning people with our own words. If you would go, hold your place in John 1, but if you would go to 1 Timothy 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. Because this leads us to a place of desperation, does it not? Which is exactly where we need to be. It's this place of desperation that then maybe stirs up the desire for us to decide to follow Jesus in the way that He would lead us to. 1 Timothy 2, 1-7 through 7, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, and that we may live peaceful, peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness <coughs> and holiness. I, I love what he says. I urge then, first of all, that request, prayers, and intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone. This is what we need to be about. If you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, a true follower of Jesus, we need to be people who are petitioning God, going to God over and over and over for Him to show us the things in us that need to change, to show us maybe a redirection for our life, showing us maybe a stubbornness in our life, showing us the area of our hearts that, it, that we in the past have kept hidden from Him. And for in this context, it's, it's actually even praying for other people. We need to be praying for other people to come to that understanding. 
Uh, some of you have husbands or wives who are not following Jesus. They're not Christians at all. And you're not praying for them. And they're, maybe they're never going to change because you're not praying. You're not, you're not giving petition to God. You're not petitioning Him on someone else's behalf. And you stop believing. Well, they're never going to change. We've been married for all these years. They're never going to change. What's, what's the use? What's the point? I'm just going to get on with my spiritual life. And I'm going to leave them up. So there's, when's the last time that you prayed for people in your own household? I mean, think about that. Yeah, that's, that's so simple. When is the last time that you prayed for people in your own household? When's the last time that you prayed for your family members, your extended family outside of your house? When's the last time that you've done that? When's the last time, again, this is not a political talk, but it's in this context. When's the last time that we have prayed for the authorities that are over us instead of talking bad about the authorities over us. And petitioning God and, and going to God in thanksgiving and prayer and, and all the goodness that He is and then petitioning God about the affairs of the world instead of just talking about those things in a negative way. But we need to be people of prayer. We need to be people who may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. Something's wrong if, if you call yourself a Christian and you look just as holy as everybody else who considers himself a non-Christian. If your level of holiness looks the same as the world around us, something's wrong. Verse 3, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ who gave Himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose, I, will, I was appointed a herald and an apostle, and I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a, and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. Again, he says that Jesus is the mediator between God and man. What was pointed at in John 1 is Jesus is the ladder between heaven and earth. He's the mediator between God and and man, back to our original passage, if you will. So even though Jesus meets people right where they are, even though that Jesus died for the sins of the world, why is it some people just pretend to be Christians, ultimately, but yet they don't really grow, and they don't really have change, and and they're not proclaiming the good news of the gospel. I think maybe some reasons why is this. So why do people pretend that everything is alright, even when it isn't? Sometimes it's just pride outright. It's just their pride becomes a hindrance. And, and maybe pride is your besetting sin. Maybe it's the most dominating besetting sin and and yet you don't have the, the change of heart because you're not humble in heart. Humble, being humble or humility is, is an opposition to pride. Pride is, is lifting oneself up and humility is emptying oneself to be filled with God. Perhaps it's just shame. And again, Jesus meets us right where we are. Maybe your past is, is nasty and it's bad and you've made a lot of mistakes. Jesus meets you right where you are. And, and the shame is not from Him. The shame is cast upon you by Satan. And Satan is trying to keep you from Him. But again, Jesus meets us right where we are. Maybe for some of us it's just guilt. It's things that we've done. And we just, we bear the burden of this. It's just all you can think about is, is not how shameful you feel and, and feeling like less of a person. All you can see is the certain acts that you've done that have violated God's law. Or the acts that have violated your, your marriage or, or violated you being the parent you're supposed to be or the, the boss you're supposed to be or the, the friend you're supposed to be. And you're just so caught up in guilt all of these specific acts and things that you've done wrong. And maybe it's just doubt. You're like, you just doubt that God is going to come through for you. 
You just doubt it. And maybe there was a time frame where you had a lot of faith. You believed of God that He could do it and He would do it. And yet you've just settled for some doubt. And this doubt is, is working in such a way to where now you're actually crippled. You are, you are crippled in and of yourselves. And you can't, you're not following Jesus because you doubt that Jesus is ultimately good. But I, I've just explained to you from the Word of God that He is the atoning sacrifice for the sins that we've committed. That He meets us right where we are. Can't you see that He's good? Can't you see that He's good? Richard Foster says this, God meets us where we are and He slowly moves us along into deeper things. And He slowly moves us along into deeper things. And I, I, I love the fact that He says slower. Because I'm not somebody who receives things really fast. I, I, I in, my own, in my own way, and God's trying to, to shape and mold and move me in this, but it, it's into the slower things. It's something I can handle. He meets me right where I am, and He slowly moves me into deeper things. And that's what He's doing for every true follower of Jesus. He's trying to move you into deeper things. He received you right where you are. He's trying to move you into deeper things. He has better things for you. It was said in Mark 2, 17, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I haven't come to call those who think they're right with God. Instead, He's become the latter, if you will, the mediator between God and man. See, the mission of John the Baptist was to point others to Jesus. And John the Baptist was mentioned right here in verse 35. His, his mission was to point others to Jesus. And what I, I love about this also is there's this connection. Andrew goes to Peter and he does the same thing. So Andrew sees something in the person in life of Jesus and he's curious and Jesus gives this invitation to follow and now he's like, whoa, I think we found the one. Although he didn't fully believe and I don't think he was saved in this moment at all. We're going to see this more next week. But in this, he was at least curious enough to tell his brother. John the Baptist, he said these things in John 3, 28. He says, I'm not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of Him. And then he says, He must become greater, and I must become less. For us to receive the promises of God and salvation from God and the direction from God, we, like John the Baptist, have to not only come to this understanding, but continually live in this understanding that we, must be, that we must become less so He can become greater in us. We have to humble ourselves so He can lift us up. That's what it says in James 4, I believe. That as we humble ourselves, trusting that He's going to lift us up because He's good. It's much better than what we would treat Him to be. Let's skip ahead to verse 37 and 38. I want us to look at a couple things really, really quickly. There's this interesting question, and it's a question that we have to wrestle with. When the two, two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following, and he asked, What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And a question that I think that most of us would wrestle with in this moment is this question. Why are you following Jesus? Why are you following Jesus? If indeed you're following. Of course, it's, it's assumed that you're following in this question. I realize some of you are not following. But why are you following Jesus? Let me give you some bad reasons why, why people follow Jesus. To cure their guilt problem. To give you stuff. To stay out of hell. To follow other people. To make you a better person. To make your parents happy. To become more moral. To achieve biblical knowledge. Or to get, to your, to get your key and your ticket to heaven. These are bad reasons to follow. Because all of those reasons are based on us and not on the goodness and glory and grace of God. You see, Jesus brings us to Jesus and our sins keep us at His feet. Jesus brings us to Jesus and our sins keep us at His feet, dependent at the, ba at the base of the cross. Dependent because we have 
that we have a spurred desire because of the grace of God is moved in our hearts in such a way. Not just the, the intellectual fact that Jesus lived, He died, He resurrected, and, and He gave all these ways to live our lives. A anybody could come to that understanding or that, that bit of information and this knowledge. But it's doing something with it. Desire and decision. John the Baptist said in John 1, 29, he says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in verse 39 and 46, there's this echo of these couple of words. Come and see. Come and see. Many of you don't know, but much of, of what we do around here at Dublin Bible Church is based off of these three words that you would experience on a Sunday morning. Because we want to be a place where people can explore the Christian faith. People who are far from God can explore the Christian faith. Now, we do preach Jesus, of course. And you're going you're gonna to hear the gospel through song and through message every single Sunday. But we also want this to be a place, a community, a family, to where it's a come and see type of, mo of, of moments when we gather together. Come and see how good God is. Come and see how the family of God operates. Come and see how, how people who've, who've committed their life to Jesus live. Come and see how, how marriages, when they're surrendered to Jesus, when, when Jesus has, has brought them to when Jesus has brought them to Himself and they are dependent upon Him and they're sitting at the feet of Jesus, see how good marriages can be when these marriages are submitted to God. That they're not living as the world says that marriages should be and, and just a rampant divorce rate and all these things, but people who are surrendered to God. See how good it would be. We want people who are far from God to be able to come into this place and come and see the, the goodness and glory and grace of God through our lives. This is what we want. This is, this is, this is, this has shaped much of what we experience on Sunday mornings. And what I'm going to talk about after the 11 o'clock service is what happens after these come and see moments? What happens beyond the Sunday morning gathering? What happens in, in, in the settings? What settings is it that, that needs to be created so that we can go just beyond these, these little come and see mo moments and then we can move into the deeper things of what Richard Foster talked about? But I'm going to tell you, you have to have a desire for more things of God and you have to make decisions that back up that, those desires. If you don't have desire and you don't make decisions in line with the Word of God, you simply will not change. You won't. But the Gospel promises so much more for us. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank You for these great people. I thank You, Lord, for what you're doing in the room right now. God, that you're moving in us and through us, teaching us. God, by your grace, allow us to, to not live like the world lives and, and to live like even what cultural Christianity, how... how that way of life is, God, but, but to what you want for us, what you have for us. God, let us be people who are amazed by you. Let us be people who, who follow, not blindly, but by faith. I thank you for loving us first. Amen. Amen.